Good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming to this AHA presidential panel entitled Students on the Front Lines, the Fight to Desegregate Public Higher Education in Georgia from the 1960s Atlanta Student Movement to the Undocumented Student Movement today. My name is Anita Casavantes Bradford, and I'm an Associate Professor of History and Chicano Latino Studies at the University of California, Irvine, where for two years I've also served as faculty advisor to DREAMS at UCI, which is our Students Association for Undocumented Students, um, of which we now have almost 600 at our campus. Um, I'm also the chair of UCI's Standing Committee on Equity and Opportunity for Undocumented Students. And it's my privilege to introduce to you today um, some people that I consider elders and role models and important leaders in the struggle for access to education for undocumented students here in the state of Georgia. Before I do that, though, I want to just give you a bit of background on what we're here to talk about today. In March of 1960, Black students of the Atlanta University Center published an appeal for human rights, which outlined their grievances of racial discrimination, segregation, and unequal access to public higher education. 50 years later, the Georgia Board of Regents passed policies that banned undocumented students from attending the state's top public universities, as well as qualifying for in-state tuition. In their struggle to desegregate higher education in Georgia today, in the 21st century, undocumented students have looked to the example set by the student leaders of the black freedom movement. They founded Freedom University, a modern freedom school for undocumented students, built intergener intergenerational and interracial alliances, and adopted strategies of civil disobedience alongside new and vibrant cultural symbols to launch a powerful student movement for educational human rights in the South. And yes, we're still struggling for human rights here in the South, surprise. Um, the panel will feature diverse perspectives from within these two movements, the undocumented students movements and the black freedom movement. Panelists will discuss the opportunities and challenges of interracial student struggles, as well as the role of media across movement generations in order to highlight the possibilities of securing racial justice and structural transformation in higher education today. So to my left, I'd like to introduce Mr. Charles A. Black, who is a decorated civil rights veteran and community leader here in Atlanta. Mr. Black attended Morehouse College and in 1958, he became chairman of the Atlanta Student Movement, which was affiliated with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or SNCC. In addition to his work as a professional actor and a community and political organizer, Mr. Black also serves on the executive committee of the Atlanta NAACP, and he's a member of the advisory board of Freedom University. To his left is Dr. Laura Emikosoltis, who is executive director of Freedom University, where since 2013 she has also taught classes on human rights, on social movement history, and on documentary photography. Dr. Soltis earned her PhD from Emory University. She's an active public scholar who writes and lectures nationwide on topics including economic justice, undocumented student activism, and interracial coalition building. She is especially committed to building intergenerational relationships between undocumented student leaders and the elders and veterans of the Black Freedom, student, the Black Freedom Movement. And to their left, <coughs> excuse me, Ms. Melissa Rivas Triana, who is an undocumented student leader from Freedom University. Melissa graduated from high school with a very strong academic record and was admitted to a number of university and colleges nationwide. However, as an undocumented student, she is ineligible for federal financial aid. In the state of Georgia, she is also banned from attending top universities and is ineligible for in-state tuition. Therefore, she has yet to begun her formal college education. However, as a leader at Freedom University, 
She has served on panels. She has lectured at Harvard and Dartmouth. And she represented Freedom University at the Freedom Summer 50th Annual Conference, which was held in 2014 in Jackson, Mississippi. It's my honor to introduce this panel to you this morning. And I'll turn it over to Mr. Black. Good morning. I want to share my speech with you. <laughs> so who are you people in the yard? Where are you from? Chicago. Rome, Georgia. Georgia? Rome, Georgia, yes. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. The rest of you are from nowhere, I guess. Right? <laughs> Anybody uh, have parents or grandparents from this area? Nobody? <coughs> oh, okay. Um, how far back? Grandparents? Uh, middle 60s. Middle 60s. You ever talked to them about Atlanta and Georgia at that time? Well, uh, I grew up in the Emory area. Oh, okay. All right, good. All right, good. I used to live in that area. Um, we're talking about a number of things this morning, and it's kind of hard to gauge, you know, what to say when you're not sure what your audience is going to be. Uh, but I do want to mention a few things relevant to the introduction that you gave. Um, I was not leader of the Atlanta Student Movement in 58. I came to Morehouse in 58, and I took over. Well, you know, somebody told you this, so no matter. <laughs> Uh, I became uh, leader of the uh, movement here in 1961. I was the second chairman. The document that she referenced, An Appeal for Human Rights, was a manifesto that we published in the uh, local newspapers as a full page ad. Uh, we had two newspapers at the time, the Atlanta Journal and the Atlanta Constitution, were separate papers, one morning and one evening paper. And it was picked up and published free of charge in the New York Times, and I understand also the LA Times, it was read into the congressional records um, in, uh, in D.C. When the document was published, the governor at the time, Governor Ernest Vandiver, uh, stated that it could not have been written by any student in the state of Georgia, a blatant indictment of his own <laughs> state's education system. Had to be written in Moscow somewhere, he said. Uh, it was, in fact, written uh, mostly by uh, Dr. Rosalind Pope, who was a student, and uh, she was president of the Student Government Association of Spelman at the time. I was asked to help with that document, and I did suggest a comma or something somewhere, I think. <laughs> um, that document kind of spelled out all of the areas of discontent in society that we had at the time, uh, relevant to public accommodations, education, employment, etc. And uh, the document was written because we had uh, been inspired by what was happening in Greensboro, North Carolina, where my friend Joe is headed to do some teaching. Uh, Joe's the guy operating the camera back there. We worked together on a film project some time ago. And the other handsome gentleman with him is his son, uh, who disappeared. <laughs> but uh, the document was written because the presidents of the schools in the Atlanta University Center had found out that we were going to do something like the students, the four students in, uh, in Greensboro, North Carolina had done. And many of them were opposed to such an action on various grounds. One, they were concerned about our safety, and also they had a responsibility to our parents and to us to provide education and keep us safe. Uh, so one of them finally suggested that if you're going to do it, we convinced them that we were going to anyhow, uh, you should let folk know why you're doing it. And that's why we published that document, spelling out our, our grievances. And on um, March 15th, um, we all about 200 of us had sit-ins in, in uh, 11 different locations at 11 o'clock uh, on that morning. Uh, these were all places that had lunch counters and some had uh, tables and chairs. And many of us were arrested and went to jail and that kind of fun stuff. Uh, and that began a year-long boycott of all the downtown businesses in Atlanta. We targeted one store in particular, Rich's Department Store, which was later bought by Macy's, the federated chain, uh, because Rich's was everybody's favorite store. And it was because Rich's had a stated policy that no sale is ever complete until the customer is satisfied. And what that meant literally was if you bought something from Rich's today and 10 years later, it didn't fit or it was worn out or you didn't like it anymore, you could take it back and they would refund your money or give you a replacement product. 
<laughs> and everybody knew that and loved riches. So we knew that if riches fell, everybody else would fall in line. Uh, the result of our boycott cost uh, riches $10 million over the, um, the, the Christmas holidays alone of that year. Uh, so they were, you know, of course, willing to talk. Uh, the success of that effort made it easier for me as uh, the chairman subsequently to negotiate desegregation of the theaters. Uh, because uh, at that session, where all the theater owners were present and had only 10 minutes to stay and uh, didn't have time for all this, uh, they stayed for four hours. We had the mayor of the, of the city at the time, Hartsfield, and to his left was sitting Richard Rich, you know that name, Rich's department store, and to his right was sitting the chief of police. So we had uh, the opportunity, I had the opportunity of uh, responding to concerns about safety and rioting and all that sort of thing by uh, saying I'm sure that the chief of police can maintain law and order in Atlanta, can't you chief? To which, of course, he had to re respond in the affirmative. And Mr. Rich uh, testified that he wished he had not lost $10 million and that all those things that he was afraid of never happened. And uh, he wished he had gone and desegregated his, his uh, store much sooner. Uh, so this, this led to a, uh, an agreement to desegregate the theaters, uh, starting with the Fox Theater and the coming of the Metropolitan Opera. Um, in addition to those efforts, um, we had to deal with the main hospital in town, Grady Memorial Hospital, which was the public hospital and still is. Uh, but blacks, black physicians could not practice there. Um, uh, and they had segregated uh, facilities. And of course, the black facilities were not quite as nice as the others. They had separate ambulances for blacks and whites, uh, about three or four times as many for whites as for blacks. And if you uh, needed an ambulance and you were black, and the two black ambulances were occupied, you had to wait until one of those was available, even if all the white ambulances were sitting there in the driveway. And I witnessed firsthand a young boy having been hit by a car only a half block from our student movement office, having to wait for 45 minutes for a colored ambulance to come. Uh, we had a boycott of uh, Grady's and protests and all that, uh, which finally resulted in a lawsuit and all that, and we uh, desegregated that facility. Um, other things that grew out of our movement were the establishment of a newspaper. The local newspapers were, of course, not giving us very favorable coverage, including the black-owned newspaper. Uh, so we started our own. Uh, it still exists today. It's called the Atlanta Enquirer newspaper. At the time, and for a number of years, it was a hard-hitting uh, human rights crusading newspaper. It is far less that now. Uh, but we were able, with this newspaper, I became editor of it sometime after I was out of school, and um, we were able to get um, a crazy young white policeman fired for police brutality. Um, we were able to get the congressman from the 5th Congressional District, Charles Longstreet Beltner, to change his vote against the Civil Rights uh, Act and to vote for it the second time around. We were able to get uh, Mayor, at the time, uh, Mayor Ivan Allen, to take down a barricade that he had put across streets in um, southwest Atlanta to keep blacks from further intruding into, quote, white, white areas. And that newspaper was uh, very successful in, um, in fighting the causes for uh, human and civil rights during that time. The mayor uh, was quoted as saying, this again is as, as Ivan Allen, uh, that the first thing he did every Thursday morning was to read the Enquirer to see if he was in trouble. Uh, what had happened was that uh, when he put this barricade up, I sent a photographer over, he took a picture of it, and I called it the Peyton Wall. It was on Peyton Road. And um, we made a big campaign about it, and he was forced to take it down because it was all in the news all over the country, and it was an embarrassment to the city. And Hartsfield, who had preceded him as mayor, told him, never make a mistake that can be photographed. <laughs> uh, Avedala was elected largely because of the strength of the, um, the newspaper that I'm telling you about. There had been an election in 1961 of uh, six candidates. Uh, Ivan Allen was uh, head of the Chamber of Commerce and owner of family business. And Lester Maddox, our renowned uh, racist uh, restaurateur, ran people away from his restaurant with a um, pistol and axe handle, uh, ended up in a runoff. And prior to this time, the newspaper, in support of more liberal um, thought, uh, had painted the two of them as being cut from the same cloth and had an editorial cartoon with them sharing a suit. Uh, so that when the runoff time came, 
there was a question as to whether or not black folk would even go back to the polls because for many of them, they saw no difference between the two of them. This led Ivan Allen to come to my side of town and meet with me uh, in uh, a French den. And uh, his arrogance suggested that he was certain that he would win because, uh, you know, black folk would definitely vote for him over West Maddox. And I suggested to him that we had a third choice, and that was that we could go fishing, in which case he would lose. And I requested that he go public and um, declare certain things uh, as his platform, uh, having to do with desegregation and employment opportunities and all that in all, all city facilities. He resisted for a long time, but the lady with him, Helen Bullock, who was the uh, executive secretary for the previous mayor, Hartsville, and then his executive secretary, then the next mayor's executive secretary, uh, said to him, now Ivan, maybe you ought to listen to what he's saying. He did agree to make these pronouncements, and uh, we encouraged black folk to go back to the polls and he was elected mayor. I want to talk a little bit about the uh, desegregation of schools in, in Atlanta. The uh, University of Georgia, kind of like now, I guess, uh, refused to admit black folk you know, for a very long time, for the first 167 years or so of its existence. And um, to flash back a little bit, back in 1950, um, a gentleman who was at Morehouse College, uh, my alma mater, had applied for admission to the law school at University of Georgia. His name was Horace T. Ward. Uh, he recently retired a few years ago as a federal judge. Um, he was denied admission, and a lot of legal haggling went on until somehow he got drafted into the military. And um, then he was accepted at the University of, um, of Michigan Law School. So his, um, his application was declared, you know, void. Well, you know, so he was not admitted. Flash forward to 1961, Horace Ward is a, an attorney. He's a part of the team with uh, Donald L. Hollowell and Vernon Jordan, whose name you may have heard in connection with Bill Clinton, good buddies, um, were the legal team. And they fought, again, to have the school desegregated uh, at the undergraduate level. And this is when um, Charlene Hunter, now Charlene Hunter Galt, and uh, Hamilton uh, Holmes, who became Dr. Hamilton Holmes, medical doctor, uh, were admitted as the first students at the undergraduate level um, in the midst of rioting and a whole lot of carrying on on that campus. Um, in the summer, before they were admitted, however, um, a, a lady by the name of Mary Frances Early was admitted at the graduate school in music. And that went rather quietly, uh, and all went well. Tomorrow is the anniversary of the admission of uh, Hamilton Holmes and Charlie and Hunter Galt. Uh, some, what, 55 years ago? Was that, would that be about right? 55 years ago? Uh, so you're here, and you can celebrate that. Uh, Charlie and Hunter Galt ended up on uh, the board of trustees there. They renamed the dormitory for the two of them on the campus. Um, Hamilton Holmes became the head of uh, the medical staff at Grady Hospital um, some years later. Charlene Hunter-Gaud is in, in South Africa where she's been a chief correspondent for CNN for a number of years. Um, Georgia Tech followed with the admission of three black students um, uh, a year or so later. So that's how those things happen. I know you may have some questions and we'll engage in all of that. One point I do want to make about this whole thing called movement. You will see demonstrations of various kinds. You'll hear slogans of various kinds from time to time, from time to time, that don't constitute a movement as such. In my opinion, a movement is, by definition, uh, it involves a deep commitment. I call it multidimensional because it involves a deep, co deep commitment to lofty principles on the part of a lot of people doing a lot of different things over a long period of time. Now, absent any of that, you don't have movement. You might have an action, you might have a slogan, you might have a campaign, but you don't have a movement. And in the case of our movement, uh, you would have been surprised at some of the things that people did that made the difference. What you saw in the news, of course, was some of us sitting in and picketing and going to jail and that sort of thing. But there were other people making phone calls, standing at telephone booths. Some of you don't know what a telephone booth is. I <laughs> Uh, to report any problem that was happening while we were engaged in these actions. There were people who simply did not shop at the stores that we were boycotting. You know. uh, and there were those who put their houses up as collateral to bail us out of jail 
folk who did not know us individually, we didn't know them, I don't know who bailed me out. Um, but they did, there was that kind of a commitment. We asked people to close their accounts with segregation, meaning you know their riches and other credit card accounts, and open an account with freedom. And folk mailed us their credit cards. Now these are students from all over the country. I'm from Miami, they don't know me. Uh, and we put all those credit cards in safe deposit box until the boycott was over. But uh, we had that kind of moral authority and, uh, and, uh, and suasion over the, uh, the community at that time because what we were doing was right. And uh, many people knew it to be right. But we were also engaged in a very selfless uh, way. Quite different from a lot of the efforts you might see today where everybody's uh, promoting themselves for the next chance to run for office or to pad their pockets. Um, we were not doing any of that. Uh, we took these risks and then went on about our business uh, without any compensation or, or any desire for praise or accolades. Um, so uh, if you don't have a movement that involves all of those kinds of things, and it can be different things, but it has to involve a lot of people doing a lot of different things um, over a long period of time. Uh, I'll stop now because uh, my hero, your heroine, whichever is preferable these days, I don't know, uh, is uh, much smarter and has a lot better things to say. And you, she got her PhD at what, age 29? Okay. 30 or something like that? But I'm a, I'm a number one fan, so um, I'll <laughs> defer to her this time. Dr. Yamiko? tough to follow Charles. I was literally taking notes as a student. I don't know if you guys were too, but I was like, really? What? Still always learning from Charles. Um, I'm just coming up here um, mainly so I can control some of the photographs. So I apologize if I'm far away from the others. Um, but I first want to thank um, Dr. Casavantes Bradford for hosting us and um, at Irvine several months ago and also um, serving as our moderator today. Um, I always have way too much to say. I'm going to try and be brief to make sure that we have a lot of time um, to learn from Melissa and her experience as an undocumented student activist here in Atlanta. But part of what I want to do today is provide some political context as a bridge from the Atlanta student movement to Melissa's experience. Um, I am a teacher. I'm not a trained historian. I'm actually an awful academic because I was getting arrested all the time at Emory during grad school. Um, and I'm always getting into good trouble. So everything I have to say today is from my experience as a teacher of undocumented students. Everything I know is things I've learned directly from them. So I'm really just a messenger of, of their movement and, and hope to provide some context to the bands in Georgia and, um, and what we can do as educators to really end this modern segregation that's going on in higher education in the South. So first, again, I'm going to provide some national context on undocumented student access to higher education and bring it down to Georgia and in the South specifically. Second, I'm going to discuss the grassroots resistance to these discriminatory laws and highlight the formation and current work of Freedom University. Um, Freedom University is a modern day freedom school for undocumented students based here in Atlanta, actually just like a mile that way. Um, I will highlight our pedagogical model, which is education for action. Um, that really combines a free area and popular education model along with the Southern Freedom School tradition. I'll also be teaching um, about how we use and employ the universal human rights framework. Um, this is really important to note also that Charles was mentioning that it was an appeal for human rights, not simply a civil rights framework. Um, and how the history of the black freedom movement and teaching this history has really helped develop students necessary cognitions for mobilization, meaning that they have a critical consciousness that enables them to identify an injustice, assert their rights, and believe that things can change through collective action. And finally, I'm going to highlight the courageous civil disobedience and direct actions being waged in the South today by undocumented students who are using tactics of nonviolent civil disobedience that they are learning from elders of the Black Freedom Movement and recombining them with their own <coughs> cultural symbols. And I will finally end by arguing the need for us to support new um, collaborations between undocumented and documented students that are happening around the country and being waged um, here in the South today. So, um, according to the National Immigration Law Center, I just want to make sure everyone's on the same page as to what it means to be undocumented. According to the National Immigration Law Center, an undocumented person is defined 
as a foreign national who either entered the U.S. without inspection or with fraudulent documents, or entered legally but then violated the term of their visa and remained in the U.S. without authorization. Of the 11.2 million undocumented immigrants in the U.S. today, about 2.1 million of them are college-age young people who would be eligible for the DREAM Act um, that has not yet been passed in Congress. Each year, more than 65,000 undocumented students graduate from high school. In Georgia, that number is estimated to be about 6,000 undocumented students who graduate every year. Most college-bound undocumented students were brought to the U.S. at a very young age. Most have lived in the U.S. for the vast majority of their lives and have attended public schools from kindergarten through 12th grade. And they currently lack a way to become legal res residents or citizens in the United States. I know you guys are historians and probably know this, but there is no line. It's an absolute myth. If so, why are there 11 million undocumented people? There is no line. Just want to make sure everyone's clear on that. <laughs> and the reason why there's even an issue of undocumented student access to higher education is because in 1982, the Supreme Court ruled in Plyler v. Doe that all students are guaranteed a K through 12 public education, regardless of their immigration status. But unfortunately, the decision did not extend to higher education. Thus, it has been up to individual states to determine policies regarding undocumented students' access to public higher education. To date, 16 states have passed legislation to allow undocumented students to qualify for in-state tuition rates. These include states like Texas, California, Utah, New York, Washington, and others. And five states offer in-state tuition by decisions by their state boards of education, such as Hawaii, Michigan, Oklahoma, Rhode Island, and Virginia. All other states require undocumented students, even if they otherwise meet state residency requirements, to pay out-of-state tuition, which is on average about 60% more than in-state tuition rates. And only three states in the entire country have an admission span in higher education towards undocumented students. Anyone want to take a guess where those three are located? Mm -hmm. The South, South Carolina, Georgia, and Alabama. So that brings us to Georgia, where we are right now. Um, in March 2010, it's important to provide this small story that really um, galvanized both the anti-immigrant and immigrant rights movements here in Georgia. In March of 2010, a student named Jessica Colotel at Kennesaw State University, about 20 miles north of here, was pulling into a parking space at her college. She was a senior in college, um, and a police officer pulled her over for not putting on her blinker to turn into a parking space. And she was later brought to jail and arrested, and she admitted that she was undocumented and did not have paperwork. And starting that day, um, they put her through deportation proceedings. Um, and this case galvanized um, both the immigrant rights community who said, she's a college student, why are we trying to deport her? Her senior year, she has gone K through 12 in Georgia public schools. She pays out of state tuition. She should be able to get an education here. And the anti-immigrant movement was galvanized as well. Um, state legislators and the Board of Regents suddenly became paranoid that thousands and thousands of undocumented students were taking advantage of Georgia taxpayers and were invading our public universities. Um, so this was going on in March 2010. With, with an insane amount of speed, by October, the Georgia Board of Regents had already proposed and was going to vote on a measure to ban undocumented students from the top five public universities and to ban them from in-state tuition. So in October 2010, the Board of Regents voted on these issues. The same day that they voted, they had the Residency Verification Committee, which was designed by the board to present its findings on undocumented students in higher education in Georgia. And I want to go into the details because these facts, facts are very important, especially when we're talking about higher education. So the Board of Regents, in passing these bans in 2010, um, did so on three counts. And they asked the residency verification to investigate these three, um, I won't call them accusations, but ideas. One was the idea that undocumented students were actually flooding the, uh, the uh, university system. Two, that Georgia taxpayers were subsidizing the education of these students through in-state tuition. And three, that undocumented students were taking seats away from academically qualified Georgians. Um, these are actually the three charges um, that the Board of Regents tasked the committee to investigate. 
So the actual committee found the following three um, results. Of the 310,000 students of the University System of Georgia in the fall of 2010, only 501 were undocumented. If you do your math, that's 0.16%. So the accusation that they were flooding the system was unfounded, not to mention racist fear-mongering, right? <laughs> Second of all, um, they found that of the top five public universities, only, only 27 students were undocumented, which is less than one hundredth of one percent. Second, the committee found that every single one of those 501 students were paying out-of-state tuition. In other words, they were subsidizing the education of their documented peers. Um, the accusation that they were a burden on Georgia taxpayers is also unfounded since undocumented <coughs> students and their families are Georgia taxpayers. They pay taxes. In 2012, they were found to have um, contributed more than $350 million to the state of Georgia. And finally, the, the idea that undocumented students take away seats from academically qualified Georgians already implies the criminality of undocumented students who take away things from others and begs the question, are undocumented students academic, academically qualified? And yes, of course they are. So with these policies, Georgia, the Georgia Board of Regents passed these two bans, policy 416 and 434, and ushered in a new era of educational segregation in the South where again, exclusion to higher education is based on racial fears and social status and not on academic merit. And it's really important to note that the top five public universities that ban undocumented students today also banned black students in 1960, the exact same five. So that's the doom and gloom part of the story. I don't like telling that part. I forgot to show you a beautiful photo of the Georgia Board of Regents, and I'll just let that speak for itself. Um, but the exciting part is that undocumented students immediately started organizing to resist this ban. So in 2010, when this ban was passed, undocumented students in Athens, Georgia, and immigrant rights activists and college professors got together in Athens to try and figure out what they could do in response to this ban. Professors said, maybe we should do petitions, we can do a faculty walkout. And undocumented students said, how about you guys do what you do best and teach us, right? So they decided to open up a school where they could continue their education in defiance of the ban. And so what um, grew out of this discussion was the foundation of Freedom University. And Freedom University, its name was chosen for two really important reasons. One, Freedom University reflects the history of the Southern Freedom School tradition in which students are taught the skills they need to survive in a, in a society that's intent on destroying them, but two, to be, build leadership from the grassroots. Second of all, the name Freedom University was chosen, Freedom University Georgia, because it has an incredible acronym that doesn't get old, which is, you know, acronym Georgia. <laughs> so this was actually um, our board member at the time, Juno Diaz, who was on the Colbert Report. Colbert didn't come up with that idea, but it made it quite popular. Um, and our classroom today, um, this is unfortunately, but fortunately, our fifth year in existence. This has now been five years since the span went into place. Um, and we continue to serve as a tuition-free, modern freedom school that provides college-level classes, college application and scholarship assistance, and leadership development for undocumented students in the Atlanta area. Today our classes are filled with about 50 students who are generally ages from 16 to 24 who were brought to the United States as children, primarily from Mexico, Guatemala, El Salvador, Uruguay, South Korea, Ghana, Jamaica, um, usually in their family's effort to escape political violence um, or to ensure their economic survival. This year our classes include um, classes such as debate, college prep, meditation, graphic design, theater, social movement history, which is what I teach, and even our own singing ensemble, the FU Singers. <laughs> <laughs> and here's our debate team. Um, Ashley's actually in the audience, Oop. Um, Melissa's twin sister. Um, and this is a debate that happened at Emory University. Um, our debates have also been held at the University of Georgia where undocumented students are banned. So in addition to the classroom, we also try to tackle discrimination in higher education by preparing students for college and advocating directly on their behalf as they apply to colleges out of state. And we are very successful in what we do. One out of five students who walks into Freedom University banned from public higher education in Georgia 
leaves with a full merit-based scholarship to a college out of state. And we do this in part through college tours in which we take Freedom University students to colleges in the Northeast that don't discriminate against undocumented students. This past year, uh, we took nine students to the Northeast where we visited Harvard, Yale, Smith, Bard, Dartmouth, Hampshire, and these students not only gave lectures there and toured the campuses, but also interviewed as potential students. And in so doing, we are trying to undercut this school to prison and school to immigrant detention pipeline and replacing it with a school to college pipeline. So while students do not earn college credits at Freedom U, um, they come because they want to learn, and this is really important to understand. Um, and above all, yes, we provide scholarship assistance, yes, we take them on tours, um, but above all, it's a safe space for undocumented students to meet, to learn, um, and to really overcome this really internalized belief that they are criminal, that something is wrong with them. Um, and they're in a space where everyone else is undocumented and it's completely okay. I think one student, Jonathan, said, Freedom is a place where you come in undocumented, undocumented and you leave unafraid. So this safe space. Um, I'm gonna try and pick up some speed, so I'm gonna skip over some stuff, I apologize. Um, but here is where we employ um, a liberatory education model based on this Freirean notion of education for action, which allows students to reclaim their sense of humanity that's taken away through bands like this and to discover how to participate in the transformation of their world. And that Southern Freedom School model that I mentioned before, um, in which in 1964 in Freedom Summer, a lot of people know about the voter registration drives, but a lot of people don't know about the freedom schools that were started. Um, again, to, so students learn to survive in a society that is out to destroy them, in the Freedom Summer own words. So as a teacher um, who seeks to provide education for action, I really draw from social movement theory just as a sociologist and a dork um, to understand um, if students are really getting the education they need to prepare them for action, for mobilization. And these three concepts, um, Pivlin, Pivot and Cloward call them necessary cognitions, um, Douglas McAdam calls them cognitive liberation, but it's students' ability to recognize injustice, to assert their human rights, and to believe that things can change through collective action. I've said this before, but these three things are necessary for students to move from being afraid to believing that things can change, right? And so I want to briefly mention through examples at Freedom U how this, these cognitions take place. So one of them um, is this new sense of collective identity and new consciousness. This is an example of Osvaldo. Um, we had a Freedom U photo project. This safe space, this new identity, changes this identity of being undocumented as something negative into something that's empowering. Um, it is not a coincidence that the safe space at Freedom U is a space where women speak up just as frequently, or way more frequently than men, <laughs> where students oftentimes come out as undocu-queer as well, um, coming out of all the dark spaces, as we say, out of the closet, out of the shadows. And, uh, and Osvaldo, in these photographs, um, we call him the selfie king, <laughs> but he also, in his photograph, um, and when he presented this, came out as undocumented and as a gay man with this photograph on the right. This concept of critical consciousness, of recognition of injustice. Um, this photo was actually taken by Melissa of her sister Melanie, um, working at McDonald's, where they both worked for several years outside of high school. Um, and I'm gonna go off with a little footnote in a second, um, but this concept is captured in this photograph. DACA, which is Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, was um, a memorandum passed by the Obama administration in June 2012. And it grants undocumented students not a legal status, but reprieve from deportation. And grants them also a work permit and a driver's license. And Melissa in this photograph captured <coughs> this critical consciousness, even things like DACA, with this quote. With DACA, I can drive to my low wage job, but without an education, where can I really go? And I want to talk briefly about this critical consciousness of DACA, of being undocumented, um, and to contextualize it, especially in the South. Like I said, DACA grants undocumented students a work permit and a driver's license. But without access to higher education and the right to vote, we have essentially recreated a new form of Jim Crow in the South, right? Where we have an entire population of young people who are funneled into a labor pool where they can be exploited for the rest of their lives. 
um, as cheap labor and politically powerless to change it through institutionalized means like voting. So um, with this critical consciousness is also the assertion of rights. Um, and we use the human rights framework for several reasons. One, it's beyond the borders of the United States. It's not just limited to the US Constitution, which recognizes only civil and political rights. The human rights framework also incorporates economic justice, cultural rights, and social rights, like the right to an education. And this is incredibly empowering to students. Um, because human rights are universal, they're interdependent, and they can't be taken away, regardless of what border you cross or where you were born randomly on this planet. And Article 26, I think, is important to articulate in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It states that everyone has a right to an education. Education shall be free, at least in the elementary and fundamental stages. Professional education and higher education shall be equally accessible to all on the basis of merit. This is in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948, right? And yet in 2015 in Georgia, this is not recognized. And finally, this cognitive liberation, the belief that things can change through collective action. This is where the history of the black freedom movement is extremely powerful at Freedom University. Um, They're actually taught a different view of the civil rights movement as, as it is sometimes called um, in the South where it is not simply one leader or a tired woman, which we know Rosa Parks was not, but it refocuses it on students and young people, right? I would say, very few to zero Freedom University students knew about SNCC, knew about the Freedom Rides, knew about Freedom Summer, knew about voter registration, knew about Freedom Schools. They were young people, right? And not, by not teaching that history, we completely undercut that power of young people, right? And so this class, I love that this photo exists, but it was the class that Charles and uh, Connie Curry came to class and read their appeal for human rights in 1960. And in teaching that document, which not only underscored that human rights framework and that bridge between racial divides and generational divides, but they taught cultural knowledge from that movement as well. Do you guys know what they're doing here? Creating Yes, but what are they also doing? They're singing, yes. <laughs> so we taught them freedom songs as well. Um, and this knowledge goes beyond our classroom. Um, it's in real relationships between veterans of that movement and undocumented students today. It's visible in when our students go to um, spaces such as the Freedom Summer 50th Anniversary Conference. You guys know what's on the left? That's a SNCC Atlanta office. Um, dear Julian Bond at the front, the late Julian Bond, and on the right were our, my students walking in South Carolina, and I was like, stop, 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 stop. Um, and I just saw that photo in my head. Um, but I think it speaks to the power across these generations as well. A few photos from Freedom Summer, that's Rita Schwerner Bender, uh, Mickey Schwerner's widow. She was a huge Freedom U groupie. Um, this is Hollis Watkins, who stayed after Freedom Summer 64, doing the Dougie what, with our students. And finally, sorry, I'm going really fast through this section. I want to talk about direct action. Um, this is directly setting up Melissa, um, who's in some many of these photos. Um, so in addition to the Freedom School, in addition to going out into the public through lectures, through college tours, we also give them practice in civil disobedience to empower them to be social movement leaders for the rest of their lives. And so um, what I want you to notice in the, these photographs, I'm about to show you photographs of the last five years of the undocumented student struggle in Georgia, is to try and notice how things have changed over time um, some tactics and strategies that they used from the black freedom movement and also how they um, use and adapt their own cultural symbols in their, in their activism. So here we go. This was in 2012 at the Georgia Board of Regents. Freedom U is notorious for disrupting every single one of their meetings. This was um, the first direct action done the summer before these policies went into effect and this is pre-DACA when undocumented students were risking deportation. Freedom U oftentimes goes directly to the president's offices at these banned institutions and asks them if they think it is you know, ethically right to ban students based on their status. And none of them respond. So 
So, so far, what are some of the visual symbols that you're seeing in this movement? Unity. Like visual symbols, what are you seeing? Cap and gown. Cap and gown, good. And what does that symbolize to you? Yep, and lack of that access to education, right? Um, this was May 2014. Um, the Board of Regents, like most oppressive institutions, adapt to movements, right? They started realizing that arresting students at the Board of Regents didn't look so good. So instead of arresting students, they would kick them out and then lock the doors, right? And we realized this by May 2014, after several years, that now the visual images were of students getting arrested on crosswalks, and it wasn't really clear what the term of the, the struggle was about, right? This action was very significant in 2014 um, because we, we learned that something needed to change, but it was also powerful because it was the first time that undocumented students and their allies were arrested at the same time. This photograph, we had students as young as 16 with allies as young as, young as 77 with Reverend Joe Beasley in the back. And I love his face in that photograph. I wish you could go up and look, but he's like, I can't believe I'm doing this shit again. <laughs> So that's Deanna, 16. She's now um, at Smith College on a full ride, by the way, up in the front. And so on January 9th, 2015, I'm glad you brought this up, Charles. One year ago tomorrow, oh gosh, you guys, we were doing this last year. Um, on the 54th anniversary of the desegregation of UGA, we decided to try something different in our civil disobedience. The crosswalk, it wasn't really clear to people in the public what the students were fighting for. And we had a brainstorm in class about doing a direct action that could be captured in one photograph what the terms of the struggle were about, right? And so we decided on the space of a classroom, that is actually where this ban is, is impacting students' lives. It is literally pulling away perfectly qualified students out of classrooms. And we wanted to demonstrate that through our action, right? And so on January 9th, we marched in undocumented students with handmade butterfly wings into the University of Georgia in Moore College in the Honors College. And we had a class. That's Lonnie King, Charles' predecessor of the Atlanta Student Movement, who was one of our guest lecturers that day. And we held a class of undocumented and documented students in an integrated classroom for the first time in UGA's history, openly. So that's Melissa, woot, walking into her class that says desegregation in progress. Us learning some freedom songs to pass the time after the building closed. And the room was packed, 50, 60 students. And um, just having a little bit of experience with university police, I gave the, the building closed at 5, and the students were like, what's going to happen? I was like, let's give the police and university presence three hours to lose their shit, and then the police are probably going to come. And at 8.03 PM, boop, police come in and threaten to remove students. Um, nine students decided to stay um, and refused to leave. One of them was Melissa. Um, and in preparation for this action, it's important to define success in any movement action, right? Otherwise, what are you doing? We define success by trying to imagine what we wanted the newspaper headline to read and what that photo would look like. And students said, we want a photograph of a policeman arresting a butterfly. Said, okay. And they wanted the headline to read, Documented and undocumented students arrested for integrating the university system of Georgia. And can you talk about the symbolism of the butterfly and what this means? Yeah, and Melissa or any of the Freedom Youth students too, you can chime in. But what does a butterfly mean to you? Change. Change, yeah. That's honestly one that we haven't really talked about. Say that again. Rebirth. I like these answers. Another one. Mobility. Mobility and migration, right? So one of the hashtags that day was migration is beautiful, which we could debate whether it is or not. Sometimes it's very violent. Um, but migration to them is a beautiful process, right? It's about survival. It's about change. Um, and guess what? We got our photo. And that's Melissa. I just heard recently that she was putting her head down because she didn't want her mom to find out. <laughs> she found out immediately on Facebook at that moment. But that was Melissa. Um, and about five hours later, they were released from athens Clark County Jail. About five months later, um, the district attorney dropped the charges. And they were released without penalty. Um, and finally, I want to talk about moving forward in this undocumented student movement. Um, 
This photo is from Emory University. Um, so in addition to civil disobedience, for the sake of civil disobedience, there's very, very strategic campaigns and disciplined actions. And this campaign at Emory was a very successful example of that. Um, in August 2014, we met with students at Emory University, the largest and most prestigious private university in the South, based here in Atlanta, two miles that way, and where you're from. And Emory University um, did not admit undocumented students as of 2014. Um, so Freedom University decided that Emory University could be kind of like riches, a big <coughs> one that we could take down. And if it fell, other universities would fall as well. So we ex embarked on this experiment to see what could happen. We had a brunch in my backyard of undocumented students and documented allies at Freedom U. And I think I said, I make the pancakes, you guys make the campaign. <laughs> and they put together a very, very solid um, campaign of op-eds, of panels, of meetings with presidents and numerous administration officials. And eight months later, on April 2nd of last year, Emory announced that it was going to accept undocumented students without discrimination and provide full, privately funded, need-based aid to students who qualify, which is huge. Woo! OK. Um, and so this photograph was taken of Freedom University students. This is before they won, but they were already acting like they won, which is important, right? So much of activism is theater, and I think it's important to practice the world that you want in order to bring it into fruition. And um, I'm not going to be super subtle, but we need stuff. <laughs> this movement needs resources. We need supporters. Um, and one thing people can do to help, one, as historians, we need history books. Yay! Um, we're teaching a people's history of the United States by Howard Zinn this upcoming semester. Um, please. Follow us on Facebook. I hope you guys are on Facebook because that's where all the Freedom U students are. Um, and our page is called Freedom U Georgia. And we have a link there where you can purchase books that go directly towards Freedom U students. Second, I'm going to let you guys in on something. Don't publish this video until after February 1st. Please, or edit this. Um, <laughs> February 1st, like Charles mentioned, is the anniversary of the Greensboro Lunch Counter students. It's going to be the 56th anniversary this year. Freedom U students are going to engage in a very mass, widespread, dangerous, awesome civil disobedience on February 1st. Um, we're expecting more than 100 students from 11 universities to join us. Um, I can't tell you much more than that other than please be on the lookout on February 1st. Um, you guys are from around the country, I'm assuming. Um, we need people to spread the word that this is happening when it's happening, um, and on our Facebook page, on our Twitter, we'll be releasing information as it comes out. Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm Melissa, uh, as Mika said, as everybody said. I'm a Freedom U student. I am in my fourth year this year. Um, oh, can you guys hear me? Oh, perfect, it's beautiful. OK. Um, so honestly, when talking about Freedom U, I really could talk about it for years and years and years. I feel like um, that's all I could, that's like the one area I guess I feel like an expert in um, because I feel like I myself have really grown up with this school, with this movement. Um, and so I joined right out of high school um, and uh, when I joined Freedom University, I felt very uh, kind of at zero. So I think it's important to realize that um, undocumented student activism, or I guess at least for myself, is a little bit different than um, than that of like documented peers. Because I feel like there's a very basic step that's kind of missing with undocumented students, and that's the, the human rights aspect. Um, and I think that's very, very important to know if you're going to engage in any kind of activism. Um, and I feel like when I started out, I had no idea of, um, about human rights. I had no idea what they were. Like, I had, I didn't know that they were a thing. Um, I mean, I knew I was human, and I knew I had quote-unquote rights, because I was like, I was a citizen. Um, but, oh, not, I wasn't a citizen, but I was a person here. Um, and so I thought I had a concept of, like, rights, but I never knew that, me as a human being, I had certain rights that were afforded to me for the simple fact that I had, because of my humanity. Um, and so when I joined Freedom University and I really learned that, and going back to that um, 
those necessary cognitions when you when I learned that that's when honestly like worlds were transformed I feel um because that's when you actually start living life and you start waking up to all these things in your world that you never knew so growing up um my family we we are undocumented um and I knew that growing up and I was aware of that but to me it wasn't something that I was like um I felt that it was any different I guess because I grew up I grew up thinking like everyone has to fear the police you know or everyone has to be aware of how they're driving at night because if you I don't know drive too fast for a little bit you could get pulled over and then go to jail like I thought that was common fears of everyone um and so to me it wasn't any weird anything weird to think about things like that um and when I joined Freedom University and I started talk like it wasn't something I could talk about with my friends at school I mean I could talk about it with my sisters and I'm super glad that I have sisters because I talked to a lot of students who they felt completely alone in instances like that because as an undocumented person you feel very um isolated partially because of mobility you can't get around too well um but because this is a huge secret of your life that you can't share too much um to you it's normal but not everybody to not not everybody and even within my own latino community it's not something that's well talked about it's even though being undocumented is um <coughs> very prevalent in the latino community it's not something that people talk about openly and it's not something that you talk about with pride um so there's also that innate kind of internalized self doubt and really self hate that you have within yourself um so you start at that point when i joined freedom years i started at that point so learning about things human rights that was really empowering to me as a person um and so i started realizing that there are all these kind of small things that people that people do throughout your life um that are really like kind of violations of your human rights like I, um but to me they were normal and to my even to my parents my parents they don't go to freedom university um but to them it's things that they're just like i mean they're just things we have to deal with as immigrants as undocumented people you can't go to the police and complain that you're like um you're being like exploited at your job because what can you do like you, you have this job and you're not going to be able to get another one so it's just like a lot of things like that in the undocumented community that um you learn to deal with um and you feel like you don't have a voice uh and then coming to freedom university us, we as students we gain that voice um so i feel like it's really important what amika was talking about um the necessary cognitions and um and the popular education because it's like those those points i can literally see them in my life as i when i joined freedom university i can literally like go back and check off when those things happened um and so starting off with the cognitive liberation even coming to class even learning about um one of the first classes i took was about the interconnected history of the united states and mexico and that's not something i had ever learned about in an academic setting i had never learned about that in school i mean i knew about mexico because my parents told, told me about it um but it's not but actually being in an academic setting and learning about how much those two histories actually have so much to do with, with each other you can't talk about us history without talking about mexican history if you want to know about real history i guess um so going into that classroom learning that um and actually paying attention to that whole other part of myself that um i've always been proud about being mexican but it wasn't some i didn't know my history and even learning that that itself is so empowering as as a person you know your history and then you you feel like you know yourself um and so continuing on that um even just learning we had a literature class um which was taught in spanish a spanish literature class taught in spanish that was a struggle because <laughs> i've never i'd taken instruction in spanish when i was in first grade um 
and then never again. Uh, so that was also super eye-opening, being able to learn about something in my native tongue. Like that's not something I would ever think about I would be doing in Georgia. Um, so it's just, as, as every course I took, I, I just saw myself becoming more and more um, enlightened and empowered about who I am as a person. So that already made me feel so much great, better <laughs> about who I was. Um, and that, when, when I, I, like I said, when you know yourself, you, you know that you have rights. So then that's the second point, assertion of rights. And that's when I started actually becoming involved in activism. Um, I first started going to class um, and I was kind of apprehensive, mostly because of my mom. My mom wouldn't let me, but I was really apprehensive about going to like actions um, because my mom instantly thought, if you go, you're gonna get arrested. And th I joined, I didn't have DACA quite yet. I was applying for it. So I was, she was like, you can't go. <laughs> um, so when I first, when I did start going and then I, I started hearing other students chanting things like undocumented, unafraid, I was, that was like, is this okay? Can we say this out loud? And then when I started saying it, like thinking back on the first time I ever said it out loud and, and there's like police there and they didn't arrest me and I'm like, okay, this is, this is revolutionary for myself. Um, and now like, honestly, ask anybody, like I, I love leading chants now, like people will just pass me the megaphone cause I'll do it. Um, and so that's, that, those two things go hand in hand when you, um, when you have cognitive liberation, you can assert your rights and you can, I can actually tell people like, yes, I deserve an education because I'm a human being, but also because I'm a qualified student. Um, so, and I can actually feel confident in saying that now, instead of being like, well, I, I understand, you know, Georgia, they don't let undocumented people because blah, blah, blah. Like, no, <laughs> that's not, it, there's, it doesn't make any sense, and I know that now. Um, and then finally into this final point where, where you believe things can change through collective action. Um, I feel like I, that's one thing that is really hard to believe um, until you see it. Um, and I mean, you always have that hope, but it wasn't until, truly until this huge Emory win that I was like, okay, things are happening. Um, and I was always with, with the movement and I'm, I was confident and I was like, I saw the veterans, especially going to, um, we went to Freedom Summer um, and I saw the veterans and they're all like, they're so badass. They're super badass. They're all super energetic. Um, <laughs> and, and you see, you saw how, like seeing how passionate they were about their movement. It made me even more fired up about my movements, but there's still that small doubt in the back of your head where you're just like, okay, I don't know if this is actually gonna work out. Um, and then with this huge Emory win, you actually see like, it's working, it's working. <laughs> and then um, and that momentum, momentum can only grow. Um, and so that, that just made me even more committed to keep going in the movement. Um, before that, though, I uh, it was I was at the action, the January 9th action, almost exactly a year ago, um, and honestly, like getting arrested is it's kind of scary. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie to you. I was freaked out. I was sitting in the classroom. They had already given them a uh, order of dispersal, um, and most mostly everybody that wasn't gonna get arrested was gonna is, had left. Um, and I was sitting there, and I was I was telling everybody else, guys, I don't know if I can do this. Um, you know, like I sat here, but I, I just, I don't know if I can do this. Um, but then I actually saw one of my other classmates, um, Arisbeth. And you guys don't know Arisbeth, but she is the sweetest, the quietest, the nicest person ever. And she, she doesn't cause anyone any trouble. She helps everyone out. And I saw her sitting there and she got arrested with us. Um, and when I saw her, I was like, okay, if Arisbeth can do it, I can do it. Um, and I was also thinking back during the class, um, I don't remember if it was exactly Loretta Ross or Lonnie King, but somebody told us, um, they were like, when we were up there, like getting arrested, like, yeah, I was scared. <laughs> I was scared out of my mind, but I still did it. And then when it's done, like it's done. And then so much good came out of that. So it definitely made me feel better thinking like you look, looking back on history, you see people from the, the 
the black freedom movement and you think like they're totally fearless they're totally badass like they had no no doubts in their mind um but actually um being able to talk to them one-on-one and being like yeah i was scared like (laughs) you think i wasn't um that made me feel so much better because i was like okay no one has to know that i was scared (laughs) if this if this actually makes it in history later like no one will know um (laughs) um so I actually, I did it and I got arrested and it ended up working out because our charges were dropped. I, didn't, I did not end up getting a misdemeanor and it was great. Um, so that all goes to say that like, I, I think it's really critical. I, I, let me actually make a note that I think it's really critical. As I was saying, those intergenerational connections are super huge that we make. Like, as I said, being one-on-one, talking to these people that did it before in the past. They were successful in what they did. Um, and now we just have to do it again. That just it makes me know that we can do it. Um, yeah. Thank you so much, <laughs> Melissa. So on that note, we have deliberately set aside the last 15 minutes of this session for you to talk to our incredible panelists. So does anyone have questions? I have to comment and question. First of all, I learned a great deal, so thank you uh, each. Uh, comment also, uh, this is one of the few panels that I've ever been to that tries to make a connection between the black freedom struggle and the Latino movement. So I applaud you for that. It's something that I've been struggling with my own research, and it seems to be that that's something we really have to get up in the present to, to really look at. Uh, my comment is really for uh, Charles. He talked about the uh, enrollment of Charlie Hunter called in the other student. I do remember that actually. Uh, but what you didn't talk about, and I want you to tie this to the comment uh, uh, between the difference between activism and the movement, is that what is the progression and what has been the progression of black student enrollment at and I'll let you just talk about that in Georgia higher education. I teach in Texas where if you look at the two flagship schools, Texas A and University of Texas, the enrollment today uh, 50, 60 years after integration is still only about 3 5 percent uh, of the total student body and, and under assault because of affirmative action. I'm glad you brought that up because uh, the University of Georgia has only 7% African-American enrollment in spite of the fact that the state has about one-third African-Americans. Uh, so to say that the challenge still remains is an understatement. Uh, and that's not just accidental. You can be sure that there are those who are doing everything they can to turn the clock back. Uh, if you don't believe that, just watch the presidential <laughs> words. Uh, um, but uh, you know, that, that's the situation here now. Um, I was one of only eight students uh, in a class taught by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He only taught one class ever, and there were only eight of us in that class. And uh, I remember one of the things that we contended on, he and I, uh, was the, the, the Socrates and Plato's notion of philosopher king. You remember that uh, it was held that people are suited for certain stations in life. Some are as craftsmen, some as soldiers or policemen, etc., and some as philosophers. And only the philosophers should rule. I thought that was a good idea. And I thought that if Dr. Mace, I mean, Dr. King had been around in recent years and watched some of our <laughs> national politics, he would tend to agree more with me and, Pro- and Socrates and Plato that you shouldn't have dumb people in charge. Um, but in any event, we, you saw the picture of the uh, Board of Regents up there. I don't know if you noticed anything particular about it. Uh, but there was one guy up there that looked kind of like me. And there were, I think, what, three women, maybe? Two, Two maybe. Uh, met with that, that uh, one black guy one time a few years ago. Uh, something we were trying to get done. And uh, it was clear that he was very much afraid to speak up to do anything. So he was like, we're really not represented there at all. That may have something to do with uh, the fact that we have 7% you know, black students at the University of Georgia. Charles, I just want to add to that. I may sort of flip a comment in the introductions for which I um, kind of want to apologize where I said, yes, we, we still have human rights violations here in the South, big surprise. Well, we have 
human rights violations in California too, where I come from. Um, and as a proud faculty member of the University of California, I still want to acknowledge publicly that the University of California does not yet have a student body that represents the racial and ethnic composition of our state, right? So this is, this is a nationwide problem, continues to be a nationwide problem. We're just kind of debating who's going to answer it because we both have lots to say. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I apologize if sometimes that's a narrative. Again, like Melissa said, we could all talk for hours. Like we have so much to say, and sometimes it's like you have 15 minutes, and you're like, ah. Um, but very much so. Um, for example, last semester's class was putting together two books. One was Undocumented by Aviva Chomsky. The other was The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander, and we read them side by side. Right. It had less to do with um, black and brown or black and undocumented access to higher education than, than shared histories, um, shared experiences with um, serving as an exploitable labor pool, than as um, bed numbers for the prison industrial complex, right? We were studying those issues side by side. So it's very much a part of our curriculum, um, which extends to um, our, our student body is, I would say, 90, 95% Latino, but we've had students um, from South Korea, from, um, of Afro-Caribbean descent, and we have a student from Ghana this year as well. So it's, like you said, not just Latino, it's racially diverse. Um, but for the vast majority of our students, they come from Latin America, right? Um, but for example, on February 1st, we have students from Spelman and Morehouse who are joining us. Um, we're in dialogues with them about um, participating in both their actions, but also something called dif difficult dialogues that are taking place at Spelman, right, about these intergenerational issues, um, class issues, gender issues across movements, right? So these dialogues are taking place. I think sometimes um, movements feel like they're constantly under attack, that like the idea of real coalition building is just so exhausting, right? Like how can we possibly show up for yours and like we are struggling to just exist or show up for our own, right? But I know that those conversations are taking place. Freedom U has definitely had students on um, not only immigrant rights marches, but in Fight for 15 in Black Lives Matter. We're participating in the MLK march, which always has like a radical contingent. We always, and are going to march on that next Monday. <laughs> um, would we like a stronger coalition? Yes. Um, but again, resources are so low. Um, I think people are exhausted in both movements to a certain extent. Yes, we're hopeful. Yes, we're fighting. Um, but I think it's something that's actually really, really difficult to do in practice, right? Constantly, um, especially when there are so many forces trying to divide them, right? Or um, we've had conversations with, with Spellman and Morehouse students just like where we're realizing there's so many basic issues about the different communities that they don't recognize or how many things they share in common. Like a lot of the students at Spellman, Spellman and Morehouse just didn't know about the ban, period didn't know about the deportations, didn't know about the Corrections Corporation of America that also runs the immigrant detention centers. Like a lot of this basic knowledge of how this society is structured is just not known. Right, so that's why the education, that's why the history, and just raising this consciousness among the communities is important. Do you want to share something as well? Yeah, um, if I could just add, um, so I recently um, got the very awesome, amazing opportunity and privilege to participate in this panel with um, a lot of activists, uh, modern activists that are working in Black Lives Matter, and it was at the 1960 Now, Sheila Prebright's exhibit, um, Artist Talk, in a lot of these activists that are working in the front lines in Baltimore, um, in, in Atlanta, in other places around the country um, working with Black Lives Matter, they were talking about their experiences. And I was the only person that I myself am not directly involved with Black Lives Matter that was there and in that panel. Um, I was the only Latina there. Um, so I feel like there's, there is this big disconnect with a lot of people not wanting these two groups to intertwine, intermix, I feel, um, making it feel like there's two different issues when they're really not. Like a lot of these issues have a lot of 
connections. Um, and I feel like it, it's a lot of things about like lack of information. I feel like a lot of people there, they didn't know about the undocumented student movement here in Atlanta. Um, and it's like a lot of the people there were in Atlanta, it was in their own backyard and they didn't even know about it. Um, and a lot of people in the Latino community and in other communities, they don't know about issues going on in other communities. So I feel like um, it's, it's lack of information and a lot of people, as Amico said, people wanting to pit groups against each other when it's like we really have to come together because it's it's all one great oppressor that's oppressing all of us. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to add that. Uh, just like to mention that uh, Lonnie King, who preceded me as chairman of the Atlanta Student Movement and I, kind of facilitated this connection between the um, the black activists at, um, at Spelman and Morehouse College uh, and, um, and, and Dr. Emiko here in, in Freedom U. Uh, we wanted them to get the message too that we are all in this game together, uh, that those who, um, who have the power and the money want us to fight each other while they run off with the power and the money. And that's been going on for a very, very long time. Um, if you look at the distribution of wealth in this country, and uh, some of you got computers, you can see what it is. Uh, the overwhelming majority of the wealth of this country is in the hands of very, very few people. Uh, 1%, and uh, to a great extent, one-tenth of that 1% uh, has so much of the money. And if you were to spread, say if I had $100 in, in change, uh, $100 bills, and I spread it out among 100 of you, that would represent kind of an equitable distribution of wealth, as it were. But if in fact I got uh, this guy sitting over here in the most comfortable chair, and the guy sitting next to him say, go around and collect all that money from the rest of you and give it mostly to him, and he keeps some of it for himself and leave the remaining two or three dollars for the rest of you to fight over, you'd have what we have in this society today. And we will tell you that uh, what you need to do is uh, get mad with those folk who don't look like you, or who don't pray like you, or who don't love like you, or whatever. Y'all fight about that, okay? And while you're doing that, uh, what we'll do is elect a senator from the state of Georgia who owns uh, Dollar General, who pays himself more in a single day than he pays two of his managers for a whole year. That's the guy we sent to Congress, to the U.S. Senate. And there are a lot of folk who think he's representing them because he's convinced folk that, well, you know, if you ain't black, you know, it's, you know me and you. If you ain't gay, you know, me and you. You know, if you, you know, if you are uh, not a Jew, or if you're not Muslim, or, you know, it's me and you against the world. And uh, these folk who are voting for folk like that are voting against their own self-interest without being aware of it. Uh, so it's, it's, it's to all of our advantage to realize what's happening and to, you know, kind of call, call a stop to all that. We're buying products from all these folk, like the Koch brothers, who own a whole bunch of stuff, and they're putting more than half a billion dollars into the current election uh, cycle to make sure that their folk in Congress, wholly owned by them and their buddies, who will vote in their interests. The only thing, way we can counter that is with our numbers. You know, you got to get up off your butts and go and register and, and vote. If those who are eligible to register and vote in the state of Georgia, for example, uh, who are black, who are Hispanic, who have regained their rights after serving terms or whatever, were to actually register and vote, the state would be blue. We're trying to make that happen by this next uh, cycle. Uh, it can happen. It probably happened in the, uh, the first election of Obama, and the election was stolen, in my opinion. It happened before in Florida and Ohio, you may remember that. But the bottom line is, we're talking about human rights. And I don't know if any of you bought into the whole notion that we're in a post-civil rights generation. Uh, that's El Toro Pupu. not only related to political activism that I experience a lot with the students that I teach, um, not wanting to challenge ideas of one's parents, not wanting to be disrespectful, but also seeing other ways forward. And that ties to some of what Charles just said, that those ways forward may actually be, in your view, better for your parents than the way they understand the world themselves. 
And I'm curious how you navigate that, or for those of you who have more generational experience, how you encourage people to think across those needs and <coughs> Okay, well, first of all, that's a really great question. Um, and I really think when I first started being involved in activism, I, I definitely did not want to talk about anything that my mom was like gonna be against. Um, and especially when I was learning more about just like just things about the world. Um, like my mom is a Catholic, she's Catholic. She, I feel like if we were not Latinos in this country, she would be very conservative. Um, <laughs> but um, for the simple fact of like immigration, she's liberal, you know? Um, but she herself, her mentality, I feel like she's very conservative um, and that's not me at all. So I feel like I've always had very like fundamental differences with my mentality than my mom, but I, I don't speak on it um, for because I don't want to offend her or because I don't want to, or I didn't use to speak on it because um, I wanted, I didn't, I didn't just didn't want a problem with my mom. But as I started joining Freedom University and learning about it and, and like, I can I say things to her now, and I definitely do kind of challenge her way of thinking sometimes, um, respectfully, of course. Try to, <laughs> um, but I think my mom has told me before that she herself has she has learned a lot with us being involved in activism and being involved um, in Freedom University. Um, a lot of things she didn't know before. Um, so I feel like, um, I definitely don't want to disrespect my parents ever, but I do think it's generally helping all of us when, if we start challenging these ways of thinking that have been instilled. Um, I definitely do that a lot more and my mom does not agree with it <laughs> to, to this day. She does not agree with it. Um, a lot of times, but I do see her changing over time in a way. Um, so it's generally positive. Um, it's still difficult to be in that position. Um, but I mean, I know she loves me and she knows I love her. So it makes, I guess that makes all these conversations more, uh, it makes them okay, I guess. And it makes them okay to have them in the future because there's always gonna be that, we're always gonna love each other and we're not, we're gonna come back to that. Um, so I think that's the biggest thing. <clears throat> I'm so sorry, we are out of time. Maybe different people could stick around to talk if they have time. Uh, I want to thank our panelists, Charles Black, Emiko Soltis, and Melissa Rivas for sharing with us today. <laughs> and I wanna thank all of you who took time to come to this panel at a conference that's dedicated to research. I want to thank you for affirming by your presence that we are also teachers and activists and that our students need us, that Freedom U needs us, and that our nation needs us to stand up for social justice and human rights. So thank you for being here today.